thanks again to the organizers for uh, this drawing here is made by one of our patients and you can well see uh, you know I mean it's exceedingly unique you can see the various figures um, so the topic given to me is why is it important to look at a patient of FEP differently as Professor Kulhara said yes it is uh, important and we'll go on to say why it is important but before that I plan to speak on some of the studies that we have done, FVP studies we have done in SCARF, uh, from which we have learned a lot and drawn our lessons. How do I go back? It's kind of running, jumping a lot, this. Go here. Okay. So I'll be largely speaking on what psychosis, of course all of you know that, what is FEP, FEP research in India and our experience. So psychosis is really an umbrella term for the clinical presentation and there is increasingly a debate going on whether psychosis is a diagnosis by itself or it is just a symptom that you see in various other mental disorders and I think very soon we are uh, proceeding towards that, the psychosis by itself cannot be a diagnosis. And up to 3% of the population will experience psychosis at some point of time. There's a lot of work which has been done in Canada, Australia and other centers where in the general population itself, people who have never been to any mental health facility, they have all reported psychotic symptoms. Uh, and. Um, in people who are ultimately diagnosed with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, the first episode of psychosis occurs between the ages of 15 to 30 years. So what is first episode psychosis? I mean, it's common sense. The first time somebody experiences a psychotic episode. However, calling it first implies that there are more to follow. But I want to tell you that that is not always the case. It can still remain the first and the only psychotic episode that people have had. So that's a kind of a misnomer, but there's nothing more we can do about it. But I, I would like you to keep that in mind, you know, that first episode need not always be followed by subsequent episodes. And when you look at the operational definitions that various studies and various FVP programs around the world have uh, uh, spoken about, it is the first treatment contact or it is a duration of antipsychotic medication, somebody who has been treated for less than 15 days or less than one month can be considered to be a first episode psychosis or considering the duration of psychosis itself. As you know, uh, those of you who have listened to Dr. Keshwin have seen this kind of graphs a lot. He talks of prodrome, there is a prodrome, we all know that and there's an acute phase and then there is a recovery. And if it is a very abrupt onset with a brief occurrence, you will only have sometimes the acute phase and recovery. You may not have the prodrome. A lot of people with FVP do not have prodrome and come straight away to you, unlike a person with uh, schizophrenia with a longer duration. So this is what we had written about some of my younger colleagues on FEP research in India. We had made a study that not much really. Um, the Madras Longitudinal Study, which I referred to even yesterday, was a follow-up study of first episode psychosis. That is why I'm talking about it now. We had 90 first episode patients. We uh, did symptomatology, we did disability. And for the first five years, there was a monthly follow-up that was mandated by the ICMR protocol. The next five years, we did three monthly assessments. But afterwards, much as I wanted to continue following up these patients, there was a resource crunch. So I was only able to make cross-sectional assessments at years 20, 25, and 35. So now I have a cross-sectional follow-up at year 35, which does not give you all the information, but nevertheless tells you some, gives you some kind of idea, gives you a flavor of what you are dealing with. So the population was a largely male, uh, middle and lower income, and uh, because it was an urban sample, it was all, all of them were living with families, they were literate, and uh, <coughs> as mentioned yesterday, the drug and al alcohol abuse was about 5% or less. 
And when we followed up, I have put down the uh, follow-up at 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, and 35 years. And as you see, the persons followed up is gradually reducing. Those who are dropped out is increasing. Uh, but even, even so, it's not a bad uh, figure at the end of 35 years. Uh, because I, I always say, when, when those of you who want to follow up, we don't have any movement registers in our country. You know, I can as well just move house and not even inform anybody. Now we don't even get letters, we get only emails. So, you know, I mean, it's, uh, there, there is no clear mandate on us to inform people that we move house. So if that be the case, it becomes more difficult to follow up patients. That's one of the problems we had. And uh, uh, what, is, uh, what has been uh, a very significant finding is 35% of those people died. They all came with first episode, then schizophrenia, and then 35% died, of which suicides were seven. And you look at the people who remitted, relapsed, and continuous illness, only 12% were continuously ill during this period, and 42% were still on treatment. But of course, I must warn you, whenever you do a follow-up of first episode, um, you do not know about dropouts. So when I say that so many people only died or so many people were continuously ill, I am not taking into account the dropout figures. <clears throat> so this is uh, the main building, SCAR. And uh, this is a book uh, we published on our 35-year history. I've given a copy of this yesterday to your director. Ultimately, it should reach your library. Maybe you can have a look. So this was a main study we did <coughs> with PEP in Montreal. Uh, and uh, this is Dr. Ashok Malla and Sri Vidya from uh, PEP. And uh, that's me and Dr. Padma, who is now the director. We were the investigators. So it was an R01 grant from NIH. And uh, the premise was that better outcomes of psychosis is largely explained by higher levels of family support. That was the hypothesis with which we started, as compared to developed countries like Canada. Well, we have been seeing, seeing this for many, many years, but we have not really proved it through uh, research. So the aims of the study were to examine variation in functional, subjective, and clinical outcomes of people with first episode psychosis, and as I mentioned, to investigate the differences in family factors. We had the same inclusion and exclusion criteria both in Montreal and Chennai, 16 to 35 years. Um, below 16, why? Because of consent, assent, and, and all those problems that we have. Uh, and uh, uh, we followed up these people for about two years using the same measures. Mid-20s at both sides, older age of onset in Chennai, more people married in Chennai, most of uh, Chennai people lived with families, 78%. Substantial proportion of women in Chennai were homemakers as opposed to uh, women in Montreal. And uh, <clears throat> there was more substance abuse, more amazing, but we, you need research to really prove what we think we know. You know, that, that is the beauty of research. And four patients again died in Chennai as compared to none in Montreal. Again, of these four, um, one was suicide, the other was a road traffic accident. This is a nice slide because we have put down the time taken for remission. So actually a lot, of, about 40 to 45 percent of people, if you see here, uh, they, they begin their remission at three months. And at 24 months, almost all of them have attained remission. So this was a course, and uh, as, as you see, 26% were continuously ill at two years follow-up. So what was the outcome at the end of two years for first episode? 72% were in remission, which is a very substantive number, and 25% only were continuously ill, and 3% have died. All this has been published. We have, we have published all this data. And this is a very interesting slide because it shows that 
Scarf team had contact with the families of 140 patients, that is 83% every month during the follow-up period. So, uh, if not every month, I strongly recommend that you are in touch with the patient at least every three months. And if not a face-to-face -face contact, at least call them up or send them emails depending on what, uh, how, how you have been uh, corresponding with them. So what are the key observations? We found a good negative symptom remission and in Chennai the proportion staying on antipsychotic medication dropped from 100% at entry. It was 100% in month 3 but at month 12 it was 55% people had stopped medication or we had felt that they did not require medication and 40% at month 24. So only 40% of those who came with acute psychosis or first episode psychosis were on treatment after two years. That is something that you have to keep in mind. And there was of course good family involvement and engagement. Then this is the next study. Uh, we did a week study with Professor Swaran Singh who is also a speaker today who is an alumni of PGI. And the centers were uh, as you can see Warwick in UK, Megill in Canada, Ames and scarf in India. So this is funded by the NIHR in the UK and we had five work packages and all of it has been published. Uh, basically the objective was to develop a culturally tailored FPP management protocol. We don't really have a culturally tailored management protocol because as you know a lot of practices that have uh, I mean, practices in the West cannot be actually transplanted to, the, uh, to our setting. There are a lot of other cultural and social values and family values we have to take care of. Then to better understand the pathways of care to develop include early detection and to create a data set of well characterized inception cohorts. Creating a data set in the, is an immense problem in India. You know, I mean, because we don't always bother to document. We, we have all the wealth of information in our heads. Somehow it doesn't come onto paper. For whatever reason, we are reluctant to document or we don't have time to document. Therefore, we have indeed created a data set both in AIMS and in, and in SCARF. We also did a situational analysis of what are the prevailing practices in Chennai. There is absolutely no clinic or service or specialized clinic in Chennai. I am sure this is true of many uh, cities as well, not, not just Chennai. Pharmacotherapy was the main treatment modality with a little bit of psychological support. The most common drugs were risperidone, olanzapine and haloperidol. And GPs and pediatricians, largely because of their inadequate training, often referred patients to other mental health professionals. They were not able to handle it themselves. So this is another publication which tells you about what are the challenges. This is from a implementation science perspective. We also had an implementation science expert there. So from that perspective, we studied the challenges in implementing an FVP program in India itself, both in Delhi and in Chennai. We also went on to incorporate a physical activity component to our intervention because uh, many of my team members felt that these kids are lazy, uh, you know, they are not into any kind of physical activity. They take the medicine and just lie down the whole time. So should we incorporate a physical activity uh, intervention package, which we have done. We have not yet published the data, but we have a short version of this in the, uh, this is a YouTube link. You can uh, see how it goes. So coming to the main question, how is FPP different from chronic psychosis? This is a comparison of gray matter decreases between FEP and chronic. Gray matter decrease is much decreases greater than first episode schizophrenia in the caudate head and, and uh, in the left uncus. Of course, it stands to reason that it is in the frontal gyrus and the prefrontal cortex, we see more of uh, changes in chronic schizophrenia. So that is one definite uh, uh, will you please uh, take into account that there is a, a fairly well accepted theory that schizophrenia could be a neurodevelopmental disorder. 
which means the degeneration could start well very early in life. That's why you see people aged 12 years, 15 years coming to you with acute psychosis. So actually the changes in the brain could start very, very early. But despite that, we see more changes in chronic schizophrenia or chronic psychosis than in uh, acute FEP. And in FEP, we have presentation of symptoms and, and precipitating factor. Uh, then we have lesser duration of illness. The diagnosis in FEP can often change. We, as I said, psychosis is not a diagnosis, right? So first you see the F, you say FEP, it could become bipolar disorder, it could become schizophrenia. So there can be a change in the diagnosis. The response to treatment is generally good. But the suicide risk is also great in first episode psychosis. They seem to have a better quality of life and lesser hospitalizations because even the families don't want them to get hospitalized. Whereas in chronic schizophrenia, it's just a reverse, it's greater duration of illness. Diagnosis largely constant while you can find some affective symptoms in, uh, creeping up in some people. The response to treatment in case of treatment resistance can go down. And there are a lot of physical comorbidities and medication side effects and more hospitalizations. Whenever you're dealing with persons with chronic schizophrenia, please keep in mind the physical comorbidities which play a large part not only in their presentation but also in their outcomes and in their quality of life. So FEP has a better prognosis. The engagement with treatment is very good in uh, FEP cases, whereas in chronic schizophrenia, we really have to work with them very, very hard to keep them engaged. Then cognition, yes, FEP certainly people have better cognition, uh, <clears throat> less economic burden versus more economic burden. And in PSR, you largely, psychosocial rehab, you need more of supportive uh, measures in the case of first episode psychosis. Whereas in chronic schizophrenia, it needs to be intense, you think of their livelihoods, uh, you think of their uh, activities of daily living and so on. And the attitude of the family gradually changes, you know, initially in first episode psychosis, it's very positive, but you can see slowly as the person is ill for a longer time, the attitude of the family also changes and that means we have to work more with them. And this was a... Um, health economist Jason from Warwick who did the analysis, uh, the economic analysis between first episode psychosis and, and it, it's a fairly uh, interesting graph but uh, they have not published this data. Obviously uh, chronic schizophrenia is a huge financial and economic burden to the family, to the patient and to the nation as such. You know if you think of number of days lost uh, and things like that. Now we calculate the qualies and the dallies and all that. So why are we looking at FEP based? There's a whole lot of publication on this, but the, the crux of all these publications is treatment as usual did not have the outcome that specialized programs had regarding symptom management and functionality. Very often I'm asked by uh, the older psychiatrist is saying, why should I bother whether it's FPP or schizophrenia, it's all the same. But it's not really the same. You do need, there is enough evidence, that's why I have put, on, put down all these papers, there's enough evidence to say that you need to take an extra step to, in order to treat FPP patients. So you identify and treat early, definitely there are improved outcomes. Younger age, pre Good pre-illness functioning. So like I said, pre-morbid prodrome, sometimes we don't see. Establish rapport in the first visit, extremely important, unless the person is very sick, of course. And what is even more important is identify one primary caregiver. In India, sometimes it's difficult because we have three or four caregivers. You know, you, both the parents are there or grandmother or there'll be an aunt in the house who is very fond of this boy or girl. But it is, it's good to identify one caregiver so that he or she takes uh, responsibility for the uh, person. Psychoeducation is extremely important and the first three months is very, very crucial. Like I said yesterday also, um, if you can provide intensive interventions of any sort, 
during the first three months, then you find gradually the symptomatology coming down and their functioning is improved. And establish a hybrid mode of contact. Now we all are doing hybrid mode of contact, face to face, telephone, internet, whatever, chat. Uh, and because this ensures engagement and prevents relapse. Try and prevent the second episode as much as possible. I know it's hard to prevent, but try and do all the, adopt all the measures that help at least delay or prevent the second episode. And hope and trust is enormous. That's what my team says. You know, if they really learn to trust you, then uh, that's a huge uh, advantage in making sure that they do well. So that's, that is it. And as I said, the main take home messages are FPP is indeed different from chronic schizophrenia and try and try and maintain contact with these many of them are very young they don't even know what is happening to them so it's good to have this kind of contact and once they learn to trust you then they have a very good uh, prognosis thank you very much so thank you ma'am thank you for a very insightful talk as to why first episode psychosis patients should be identified all the symptoms that these people could have and look at any other precipitating factor or causal causative factor like cannabis or you know interpersonal relationships uh, because we we can't just treat the symptoms alone so the family can help you in a large way uh, if they say he has been failing in class